Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. We're talking with Joe Lamond, Chief Executive Officer of the National Association of Music Merchants, or NAM, as most of us know it. And NAM is certainly more than a show, but we'll get into that in a moment. I'd like to first just get a little bit of personal background from you to just very briefly sort of chart how you ended up where you are today. Hmm. Why does that sound like a bad Cheech and Chong, you know, 70s? <laughs> I'm going to talk about my background for Um You know, I am a NAM member. You know, example, probably as much as as anyone. I mean, you say what what is an industry that is so diverse as ours? What is the typical practitioner? Well, there isn't one. You know, generally, they uh, consist of of uh, artists or musicians who have found um, a particular path, and then maybe that path moved, and they moved over, and through all the sorting, the Harry Potter sorting hat, you find out where your maybe internal skill set is and you are found that you're a wired person for a certain you know task in the studio or making new instruments or being on the road and mixing or perhaps you know ending up you know helping um the industry gather through things like the nam shows or our lobbying in washington so that's how i, I stumbled upon this quite frankly after having uh, done a lot of things in the industry like a lot of NAM members i i, I would I would paint myself as a very typical um, person that was that would be walking down the aisle of a, of a damn show floor. Mm -hmm. And so, so you, I told you absolutely nothing. Well, no, I'm, but I'm, I, I, I think that's a really interesting point, though, because that you know, the point that you raise about sort of figuring out what our skill sets are. Um, I've always said that I'm a firm believer in sort of watching the path illuminate as I walk down it. You know, mm -hmm. and. Yeah. Because to a certain extent, most musicians are kind of autodidactic. You know, we, we teach ourselves a lot of what we know and we absorb a lot of information and then spew it back out, shall we say, in our own, you know, through our own personal filters. Um, you know, it's interesting to me because I personally, for example, you know, I come through a musical background, but also a studio background, you know. I know other people who have come through a retail background, you know, and it's interesting to me to see, for example, that those people who come through a retail background have a strong understanding of, let's say, concepts like marketing, you know, mm -hmm. whereas you have other folks who are very, very involved in the technical aspect and almost to the point of not being able to really switch gears and get back into the creative aspect. And so, you know, NAM members, when you talk about being a typical NAM member, come from a whole lot of very different but converging backgrounds in certain ways. Yeah. Well, that's and, what makes the whole thing work. Yeah, yeah. And I've always found mm -hmm. that interesting. And in fact, when, when NAM started to, um, you know, when I, when I first started going to NAM shows, which I have to admit is somewhere around 30 yeah. years ago. Um, I like to refer to it as my first NAM show was shortly after the earth cooled. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Dinosaurs were still roaming the earth and all of that. Yeah. Um, but it was much more retailer oriented. And as new blood has come in, you know, first the pro audio sector started integrating itself and then the installed AV se sector started integrating itself. And I think these are all very similar backgrounds and yet very different and so when you start to merge them into what it's become now um i think it really has sort of changed the whole tenor of the organization and in particular changed the tenor of the show yeah you know you think about um that career path we just talked about you know from learning to play possibly learning to work in the studio uh, having a passion for music in some way, and then thinking about how that might lead you on a, you know, on a journey of, of discovery. We're all very curious people, by the way. I think, you know, I think uh, people in this industry are curious, they're passionate, um, they're opinionated, <laughs> uh, 
and, and, and but yet they are absolutely fraternal. I think people in this industry, industry you know, have that kind of common bond of music. But my point is that you do these different things through your career. So I worked retail. I was an install. I was a touring musician. I was a touring staffer. Um, and you add all these things up, and those are just the scratching the surface of the different career paths, right? But you add all those up, and that's really what we tried to approximate with the NAMM show, which was people that are involved in the trade may do all those things, or none, or all, or some, and that made me feel that that gathering of people had a lot in common, right? They actually have a lot in common. Okay. And the fact that they use this gear, and they manufacture, and then they are absolutely involved in all aspects of it, from teaching a fourth grader their first instrument all the way to maybe mixing a cello. You know, there's not a whole lot of difference. We're all part of the same tree, basically. And the trunk of the tree was moved. And so that was really kind of the, the stimulus for Crossroads, you know, this kind of um, idea that, that everyone involved in the trade actually has a lot more in common and that we can learn from each other. And that by bringing all those groups together, all those segments together under you know, the guise of a week-long NAMM show would actually be additive, it would be multiplier. Uh, one plus one would echo, but actually way more than two. Um, it would drive the industry forward. And also, you know, help create this vision of a, of a world where music and art was actually valued, appreciated, and, and growing. And that was really the crossroads vision we had, which is bring all of us together. Because you can't separate one for the other. We kind of look at them walking down the aisle and they look different, they speak a little differently. You know, each segment of the industry has their own customs, right? You know, that's why certain groups meet at the Marriott poolside and other groups meet, you know, at a certain time, maybe over here. But at the heart of it all, they're involved in the, in the trade and bringing music and art to the world. So that's what we tried to approximate the name show. And by doing so, we actually created something very magical. I mean, it's something that people will crawl through busted glass to get to. And I can't explain it other than that, um, that it's a, an amalgamation of everyone involved in the trade coming together for a, a couple of days to expand the whole vision of what music and art can be in the world. And by the way, uh, just going on record, I think we need a little more of that now. <laughs> than we've ever needed it in the history of the world. My it's opinion. so true. It's so true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I would agree with you. But, but, you know, to your point, it's interesting because, um, you know, I was having this conversation with someone earlier, how so many of my business relationships you know, almost immediately evolve into true friendships, you know, and I have, and I'm sure the same is true of you. We have so many people in this industry that perhaps the relationship started as a business relationship but it's so much more than that it's so much richer than that and always has been richer than that because we have this common ground that almost has nothing to do with whether or not we have a business relationship it has to do with you know you know i mean for me for example and i've, I've said this for years one of the things about going to a nam show in particular is that it's like summer camp you know, yeah. I run into people I haven't seen in a year or maybe just a few months. But, you know, the first thing you talk about is not, hey, how's business? It's, you know, how's your family? What have you been doing? You know, um, I mean, these are these are truly personal relationships and they're based on the fact that we have this love of what we do. We have this love of this industry that we're in. You know, I um, one of my mentors coming up was uh, gentleman I think you knew as well, uh, John Stierenberg. And uh, John and I used to talk all the time about how what makes this industry different is what makes us cling to this industry. And, yeah. you know, how for me in particular, you know, I mean, I, I started a PR company, but it wasn't to do PR. It was because I understand these people. I can talk to these people. I can speak their language. They speak my language, you know, and it's a it's really on such a personal basis. And I think that's what makes this industry different yeah. from so many others. Look, you, you've got you need to spend your life in one endeavor or another. We could have all gone into plumbing fixtures. 
and I got nothing against plumbing fixtures. I'm sure they're exciting. But your point, none of this can substitute for the fact that business has to be conducted. And I think that's what we really have to think carefully about. The NAMM show is a platform, a safe, reliable, predictable platform for business to occur. The fact that the fact that we love seeing everybody while we're there and create these lifelong connections and mentorships, you know, that's the glue. But, you know, I always realize that it still, it still has to work. But, you know, to your point about having choices of how we spend our time and meeting people like John, I will tell you there is one voicemail on my phone right here that I have saved and I will save forever. And it's the last message I got from John. He, we had a monthly call. We would talk a lot. And uh, he called me three weeks before he passed. And uh, I got voicemail and ended up talking to him later. But I saved that voicemail because I want to hear his voice again. I, and, I have done the same. I have my I, I have saved yeah. my last Skype chat with him for the same reason yeah, we had. So, I mean, that's yeah. that stuff you can't um, describe is the value is the value of it in this way we've spent our life doing this. Two points I want to make. So, as a drummer here, I'm going to try and stay focused and see if I can make them both. <laughs> First one is that's what the NAM Oral History Program is all about: capturing the stories. Um, for future generations to learn from. We've got almost 4,000 digital interviews now stored, the largest collection in the world of industry participants talking about their careers, uh, what drove them, that, what great strides in their, in their businesses and why did they do it, and all those things. And then their personal stories, all captured, all free, all on the net website. So again, I just, um, I value that. You can't find it on the balance sheet per se. It's not a revenue generator, but it is a heart. And to have that captured, I mean, more, there's, I think there were two interviews done this morning uh, that we're just adding to the collective. So that's super important. Second thing I want to make is that I was worried that as a generation, you and I are both a little more snow on the mountain, right? You know, we are, we are on this side of it. And I was worried that maybe the younger participants in the industry wouldn't feel the same way. And I can tell you, they do. They do. The more I see of the young people coming to NAM every year, and, and I meet with, we bring 100 college students on scholarship to come to the NAM show. They go to this essay program, and I read all the essays. Of the thousands that we bring, we pay for 100 of them to come. And they meet every year at the show. They are now dispersed around, handing out resumes, trying to find their place in the industry. But we are feeding the next generation, and yes. they are now I have their own memories of the show. They now have their own um, you know, things that they're developing as their customs and, and things that they will do year after year at the NAMM show. So I, I'm more confident than ever that, and it just speaks to human nature, really. You know, people have been gathering for these types of pilgrimages since the dawn of recorded human history. 6,000 years, <laughs> people have gathered annually for all kinds of weird things, right? They, they just, I think there's an innate genomic message that drives humans to gather. And it probably is about survival. You grow and you learn and you learn from each other. Um, but the fact that we've been coming together like this, I think is, you know, it's just part of being, being human. So I was surprised, but then I wasn't surprised. You know, I'm glad the next generation coming up is feeling the same way and participating in the same way. There'll be us someday sitting here waxing philosophically about my first NAMM show is, was in 2020. You know, ours was that my NAMM but the idea that this is a continuity that the industry, I feel comfortable the industry is going to be driving forward. People like my daughter that you interviewed, they are passionate about this industry. They are going to lead it. They're going to do a better job than we did in development. And I could not be more excited to see that sea change of young coming in, young energy coming in. Yeah, I'm sure. Diversity in our show. 100 180 countries, I believe, in Music Week. We're getting 130 countries coming to the NAMM show. We have our only United Nations. And that is what I really feel is special about what we've gathered, what we've produced, and we've done it safely, predictably, reliably. Those are the things that, that you know, we talk about service. Your role in service is to be creative and help people find their voices, you know, in their companies. Our role in, in service is to create this platform reliably, stably, so that all this crazy entrepreneurial activity can occur. Entrepreneurial activity cannot occur in, in a room that's already crazy, you know, there's a there's a, a theory called entropy that you've got to have a stable pipeline. They use it in the cell phone industry that, you know, the idea of trying to push so much content down cell phone, the, the, the vehicle of it, the, it took 
a stable, reliable platform so that at each end it can be decoded and understood. Right? That was the early theories of cell technology. Yes. You needed this stable pipeline for all this to happen. Well, that's how we modeled the NAP show. Tried to, you know, underneath, trying to be innovative and doing the things we need to do to create a valuable experience with good ROI for people. But on the surface, you can count on the NAP show. That's part of our level of service. That if you have a new product, you're a small company, you've just you know, got an idea, you know you can come to the NAP show and meet everybody. If you're a large established brand, you can go to the NAM show and make sure that your supremacy is established and, and confirmed. You know, <laughs> wherever you are in that chain, and by the way, there's always someone coming up. I love the new entrepreneurs every year at NAM with one idea. You know, there was Bob Taylor in 1977 and Kurt who brought Taylor guitars to the show. There's always this undercurrent of new coming up because for artists, we like it's it. true. It's true. But I understand our role of being. Um, trying to, in almost some ways, just be that platform, that stable platform. So, um, but in service, all of us as, you know, and anyone who's, you know, we're talking to the trade primarily, like your audience is going to be trade oriented, finding our spot and, and clearly defining, articulating to a fine degree what it is we do is really important to success, I think. And I think for NAM, it is in gathering on a stable, reliable, predictable platform, the global industry each year at the NAM show. So that's important. I think for young people coming up to really identify, even though they may try different things along the way, identify their superpower early and develop it to the best of their ability, and that will lead them to success. Well, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up because that is, I think, I would guess one of the biggest challenges as NAM grows both as a show and as an organization with with more and more touch points the challenges of integrating these different worlds these different cultures you know we always had the running joke um in live sound you know the the sound guys never talk to the lampies you know uh you've you've oh. got these jokes in in you know you've you've got all of these different cultural uh, shifts and cultural groups that come together. You know, there was always the running joke, and I'll give you a perfect example. When when Nam, uh, no, excuse me, when Avid purchased Digidesign, there was a running joke about the culture, the cultures uh, merging between you know uh, what we used to call the the guys in the chinos in in New England and the Southern California guys and the Bay Area guys and. You know, there are these different cultures that all come together and yeah. merging those cultures, merging those communications, that's a challenge. And I think for NAM, that's got to be a big challenge in terms of just making, making sure that you're both inclusive and paying attention to all those different factors, is it not? Yeah, I mean, you've nailed it. I mean, um, how do you celebrate those differences and uh, yet and also have everyone? Them. So look, the analogy I use is, and you've hit on it, is my touring experience is right. Some guys don't like white guys. No one likes the background guys or backline guys. Uh, local crew is always to be found. I mean, you know, just you name it. There's discrimination <laughs> galore on a tour. Um, yet, at 8 p.m., when the artist hits the stage, drummer counts in the shoom, sound, lights, crew, gear, everyone. It's Tears. one world. Everything works. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. For the audience. Mm -hmm. And and that they is... Don't need to know the, yeah. the audience doesn't know that the rigor's on the bus sleeping. You know, he doesn't have to wake up until the show's over. <laughs> you know, all they know is when that downbeat occurs, everything works. And so that's how I look at this NAM community. We celebrate the differences. I mean, you know, piano and organ, school band and orchestra, um, the rock and roll combo guys, live sound touring, recording, um, those in development, all the OEM companies that just make like, you know, little bits of something that becomes a musical instrument. Mm -hmm. They're all part of this whole family. Pro and AV guys, same God. thing. And, yeah, you know, the guys putting up, I mean, uh, we, yeah, putting up loudspeakers in churches and, and, right. and yeah, I mean, we're all part of that same world. And that's what I, yeah. uh, that's what I love. And that's what I think must be a big challenge that's is right. the idea that's of, right bringing all of those worlds together and realizing that we all do have a common love for what we well, do. 
you know, you could argue that that is not, you know, unlike what we've got to do in our politics. We've got to find the common ground and emphasize that and move forward with just the, the larger key areas of agreement and leave the, you know, cascading areas of disagreement for some future generation to solve. Let's, let's solve big things for the reality is we want more kids in school to have access to music. We want more music supported communities for colleges, you know, to all teach how we can, you know, be, have a career in all this. We want more live music. We want more live theater, more live festivals. We want safe gatherings of all these things. So those are the big things we can all agree on. And then that's why I say as an industry, we work on the big things and make sure that we can move everything forward. And, and you know, we'll get to the fact that light guys don't like sound guys. We'll get to that, you know, we'll get to that. You Maybe. know, to me, uh, to me, I think, um, and, and, and you probably have a similar experience, part of what I love about having had so many careers, so to speak, within the industry, is that I've got this certain empathy for so many different positions, you know? It's, uh, I do understand the light guys, I do understand the live guys versus the studio guys, the songwriters yeah. versus the performers. Yeah. Uh, you know they're not wrong no no of course and <laughs> and you know that's just it i think it's it's important for us as the people doing what we do to be able to really to to embrace that empathy to be able to understand where everybody's coming from you know nobody's position is wrong nobody is more you know annoying than anybody else but we all make jokes you know it's like you know all the great drummer jokes i know all the great bass player jokes you know at the same time i think that's really what makes us work together so well is yeah. that diversity but it's yeah, got to be a challenge yeah. for putting together a show of this size well that gets back to the service angle right can we help each of those groups be more successful in what yeah. they do yeah. Um, and recognize that, that everyone has a role to play. You can't do a show unless all those people do their job, right? You just can't. Um, even down to, you know, an arena. I remember one of my jobs when I was an installer was like putting the system in the old Arco Arena up in Sacramento. You know, yep. that all happened, you know. Um, so and that is behind the scenes. I mean, I'll, I'll always remember the, the glamour of, of all this. I was, as an installer, working under some 150-year-old church, I think in Dixon, California, under the sacristy, stapling up speaker wire with a crawl space about this big on the dirt in about 110 degree, by the way, Sacramento summer, mm -hmm. and like leaning over and seeing what was left of a petrified dead rat. As I'm underneath this, as the youngest guy in the crew, I of course got of course. me. The, of course. The skinny guy, send him under there. Yeah, and I'm later, and I'm still a drummer, right? I'm still playing a lot, and, but this was my day job. And I'm just going, I love show business. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all that has to work, right? It, it's um, true. It's true. And, and, you know, at the same time, then, you know, we walk through something like an airport terminal and we say, oh, I know what kind of speakers those are. And, and you know, right. and you really do have a, an appreciation for every single facet mm -hmm. of the industry and how everybody's parts really support everybody else's parts. Now you take that little kid who's underneath the church sacristy stapling wires, skinny little kid, and then you put him in a White House. Yeah. Talking about music education with the President of the United States. Yeah. That shows you what's possible in this world. That shows you what's possible in this little industry of ours. It's Pretty true. Cool. It's true. So tell Pretty me cool. a little bit about um, the, the I, I hate to use the pivot word, but the transition that NAM has had to make, and not just NAM, but all organizations. You know, the last year has been an eye opener for all of us, needless to say. And yeah. there's been, you know, there's been positive and not so positive experiences in terms of making a trade show virtual. What aspects of that did work? What aspects of that do you feel, you know, could be improved upon? How do you think we're going to integrate that into? shows going forward you know you start with the fact it's march of 2021 still in the middle of it yeah right this ain't over yet and i will borrow a phrase from the historians when asked to comment on the true impact of the french revolution most will reply it's still too soon to tell 
who knows how this is going to play out? I mean, all I know is that we're still trying to figure out return to safe school openings, concerts, festivals again. I mean, our industry is involved in social proximity, right? Music happens when people are together. Um, and so we're trying to all collectively figure how, how that might work and to do it safely. There will be a day when this, right? Pandemics come, pandemics go. Historically, they do end at some point of their own or through the magic of science and medicine. But this will pass. This too shall pass. What it looks like on the other side, it would be fascinating. And for us as students of history, you know, how will a the technology of, of what we do with Believe in Music Week lend itself to the physical gathering? They're going to be both. There's going to absolutely be both. There were parts of that that worked wonderfully. Education, scheduling, matchmaking, networking, all those things were enhanced by the technology. We're gonna leave, you know, make sure that all that comes along with us. We'll leave behind some of the stuff that didn't work right. I mean, I didn't feel connected to you when I was on, you know, when Herb and I were at the anchor desk, I'd rather been sitting with you and talking with you in Anaheim. Uh, Andy Zildjian and I were, you know, Zooming together. And no, I wanna be, you know, at the Hilton restaurant having breakfast with Andy. I, I want that stuff, you know, yeah. uh, and that's what's going to return. So we're going to actually have to put a lot of this together. Um, now, I, I, I was thinking about this the other day about what the impact on the industry will be. And one thing I've, I've kind of stumbled upon is that I do believe there's a lot of young leaders in companies right now. Uh, you know, Brian Ball at Sterling Ball, Third Ernie Ball, uh, John Daddario Three. They, Two good friends, two young, just superstars. They both became CEOs of their companies like months before the pandemic. That's tough. They are now General Marshall, General Eisenhower. I mean, these people are war tested generals now. And there's a whole generation of them that have now been forged through this crisis of budgets and distribution and supply chain. And, and by the way, some of the industry did fantastic through the pandemic. You know, instruments that were played at home, guitars, that kind of keep it with the people at least. They had more of a supply chain than they did a customer issue. Sure. Live sound, as we know, anything related to events were just shut down. But everyone was tested. And so I do believe what I'm most confident about is we have now created a generation, maybe the next greatest generation, who have been through something that no one else living had been through. And I would just try and imagine, uh, you know, in some few years from now, somebody brings a, an, an enormous question um, to one of these future leaders' desks and saying, this is a crisis. We have, you know, and they're just going to look and go, I'll tell you what a crisis is. Hey, you want a crisis? <laughs> you want a crisis? I'll give you a This is a problem to be solved, and it's called work. You know? yes. um, but I think there's this generation that's just going to be like steel, you know, like, you know, and, and it's, and it's, men and women and people from around the world who have all just been tested. And again, I'm more confident about the future because of that than ever, because you can't learn that in a, in a class. You can't hear from you know a mentor. You can't experience it until you've been through a crisis like that. And they've come out stronger than yeah. ever. And yeah. so I, know, I think we have a whole new generation of leaders that um, are gonna be incredibly effective. Well, you know, it's interesting that, that you mentioned that because I think a lot of those same issues have been playing out in music creation and content creation for years now. I mean, you know, if you think about the idea, I mean, you know, I worked in the studios in the 80s and, you know, we somebody didn't show up at a session, we would joke that so-and-so is going to phone in their part, you know. And mm -hmm. now, I mean, I phone in my parts all the time. You know, I sent a bass part with video over to England a couple of months ago, you know, and these are the kind of things that are now commonplace. And, yeah. you know, of course, it brings with it certain challenges. I mean, one of the one of the conversations that I have and one of the one of the tech track panels that I've done for several years now has to do with what I call the art of production, which has nothing to do with what microphone you use and everything to do with the relationship between the artist and the producer. And mm -hmm that is something that cannot be learned remotely. So for example, you know, there are those kind of challenges that we are dealing with now, whereas we've become much more technically savvy 
and able to phone in our parts, we don't have those same hands-on opportunities for a lot of young people now where they can yeah. learn about the psychology and the relationships that are built within the artistic process. And I think a lot of those same issues, you know, you were faced with in terms of how are we going to, how are we going to replace that component without the live interaction? Right. And you know, to what degree? And those are, th those are as you say, they're, they're not gonna be questions that we can answer yes or no, yes, this is the answer right away. They're gonna be ongoing questions that will exist you know, infinitum, really. But yet, now the challenge has really made us face those questions in a way. Well, I mean, you know, will we, will future, near future generations look at, you know, recording and music pre-2021 like we look at the old George Martin mixing consoles? You're like, wow, how did they do that? You know, I got more technology right here, you know? Exactly, um, exactly. Well, they wow, look you, at us. You didn't up. have faders; you had knobs. Oh my gosh! You know, <laughs> and, and that may be, and maybe that's how it's supposed to be. You know, but I will say, where will those uh, discussions take place, and where will those solutions be forged? At the yeah. NAMM show, yeah, the platform where all those tribes gather. You know, and it may a, a partial solution may come from a a band teacher and a software. May I need I need this to teach. A solution may come from a a live sound engineer who says, no, I, this is what I see about it. It could be an engineer at Yamaha uh, or Roland who says, no, here's how it should be. But all those ideas will go through this crucible. It's like a crucible of ideas. Yeah. Good yeah. ideas will come out. That's where the NAM show will, will be vital is to bring all those groups together to form this crucible. I mean, a good idea will forge through. I used to say, you know, there's a, there's a great uh, Will Durant uh, Lessons of History, which is one of my favorite books, um, that out of 100 ideas, 99 of them will not be good enough to replace the existing way of doing things that have been forged by generations of, of people working together, thousands of brains. You know, 99 of those 100 ideas will not be better than those collective ideas that, that have become normal. But one idea will. Yes. And that and one idea will change everything. And so the idea is to sort through those 99 ideas that aren't as good as what the existing systems in place offer, and then to find that needle in a haystack and then know that, hey gang, we're going over here, that it's a huge uh, leap uh, forward. And so again, gathering all those minds together at an AMP shows where those one out of 100 ideas, one out of 1,000 ideas spring from, in my opinion. Yeah, and, and to continue your analogy, I think, you know, that one idea may be the seed and those 99 ideas may be what fertilizes that seed, you know, sure. because everybody's got a little bit of something to contribute yeah. to the solution, you know, and, and the solution doesn't just by, happen. And if you're only surrounded by the same people who think like you, you know, if you're in a piano organ business, and that's all you surround yourself with. It, there's these great ideas coming from the school side or great ideas coming from the studio side. You need that fringe or outside idea to come in and, you know, create Absolutely. what... Yeah. No, that's just human nature, too. That's Absolutely. why people gather. I mean, you know, yeah. You know, on, on, there have been you know, numerous historical records of where, you know, groups would gather in these pilgrimages and they would probably trade. They would probably share different techniques they've learned from everything from, hey, what's that? Um, I don't know, I just kind of invented it. It's, it's a wheel that turns and everything. It's like, I like that. And, and then someone else, you know, eons later at another gathering of the, the metaphorical, you know, earlier folks, what's that? Fire. Man, it's the best in the wintertime. It's the coolest. Really? Sure. How do you make it? Sure. Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, so follow our, our early, yeah. you know. Look, look at the old, and, like, yeah, look you know. at the whole Silk Road thing with, you know, herbs and spices being brought from yeah. one region of the world to another. You know, Italian yeah. cooking would not be the same had garlic not been brought in. What I'm saying. And, and so, again, I, I just think that's encouraging for our future to know that, and, and more than ever, the mentoring that's going on, you mentor, I mentor. There's so much sharing going on. Um, all the groups that are, are raising up, uh, that like my daughter's involved in, that are raising up the diversity of the industry. 
you know, that to me is what's one of the sea changes that's going to change and improve and really kind of redefine the whole industry going forward. Absolutely. Um, those things, didn't, they didn't happen even when I was coming up. If I, if I had access to a mentor when I was a 21-year-old kid working at Skip's or Andy Penn's Drum and Guitar City, I would have... I could have really made something in my life, you know? And just, so I just think today we've got so much more opportunity to share and to mentor. Um, that's another one of the big changes that are happening and what I really am happy about the NAMM show. The NAMM show is a place for mentoring and of creating those relationships for mentoring. Um, and and the, down, the downstream impact of that is incalculable. So I'm really happy about that. I would agree with you. And in fact, you know, it's, it's interesting for me that you know, years ago when I started going to NAMM shows, I was going first as a, I guess, as a spectator, quote unquote, you know, um, and a yellow badge. Yes, exactly. You know, and then, uh, you know, as an exhibitor working with companies, as a press agent working with my clients and in the last few years in particular in leading panels, in working in an educational capacity, it's been the most rewarding thing for me of anything because I've been able to reach back into all of those things that I've learned over yeah. the years. And, you know, I, I, I think to me that is probably the most wonderful aspect of having a little snow on top, you know, is being able yeah. to pass some of that knowledge on, you know, and, and pay it forward. I think that's part of our, our DNA too, as, as um, musicians, you know, I mean, I just love the fact that people want to share and they oh, yeah. want to, uh, you raise a funny story or a point that may, reminds me of a funny story. Um, and it speaks to the fact that there are so many people in and around the NAM show, and they're not just all manufacturer exhibitors, and they're not just all retailers. I mean, you think the old days, it was just manufacturers and retail. It was never that way. It was always this mix of, of participants. And there's a great story of how you should never judge a book by its cover, um, but depending on what color badge you're wearing. Right? And um, it was a story some years back where uh, there was a, a visitor at the Hell Leonard booth, and they were hoping to speak to the CEO. And of course, you know, at an AMP show, it's busy, and you never know who's who. This person had a yellow badge, so they weren't a, a buyer that you're just saying, I gotta meet with that person. But the Hell Leonard staff was really smart. They've been well trained, and they were courteous and kind and said, um, Sir, this um, CEO is in a meeting right now, but if you'd like to wait, you know, here's a comfortable spot, and we'll take, you know, you'll be in as soon as we can get you in to see him. And that was the perfect answer because that visitor, Yellow Badge, ended up being head of Motown. And Hal Leonard had been trying to get the Motown print rights forever. <laughs> and it happened then at the NAP show. Had they not taken this person seriously and looked at his badge only and said, oh, Yellow Badge, yeah, yeah. We, they would have not had this great opportunity. But those are the kind of serendipitous, opportunistic, uh, you know, things that come along. Um, but you've got to seize them, too. You've got to be ready. you got to be... Yes. You just never know who's going to be walking down. <laughs> you know, there was a picture yesterday, uh, our Mark out said, it was the blast in the past. He goes, I found this picture and I did, it was too good to not share. And it was a goofy picture of me. I think Frank Alkire at Music Inc. one year had sprained his ankle or something. He was on a scooter, like one of those little scooters. So I, I had jumped on a scooter and was making, you know, funny motorcycle thing or something. And, and they sent me the photo. So this is a funny picture, but look in the background. In the background, I had just finished a press conference. As I'm doing this goofy thing on a scooter, sitting right behind me is Yoko Ono and Quincy Jones. <laughs> we had just finished the press so, You know, it's like only at an app show moment, here I am being, you know, stupid. And right behind me are two of the most, you know, influential people in our industry. You know, it's just that, that's a classic damn show moment, you know. So again, you just never know who you're going to meet, who you're going to see, and that's the serendipity of opportunity. Uh, and and that's just, that, that goes well beyond the NAMM show. I mean, that's, that yeah. goes to how we conduct ourselves in life in general, in personal life, you know. I mean, uh, I did artist relations for sure microphones in Europe for many years, you know, and I had people approach me who I didn't know, you know, but I'm not going to be a jerk to them because it's just not my nature. And, you know, sure enough, some of those people turned around later on and, you know, more or less repaid the favor and connected me with wonderful opportunities, you know, both professionally and personally. And I think, you know, and again, those people remain to this day, good friends, yeah. you know, and that's one of the most wonderful things about this industry in general, is just that you really, 
you know, if you're a jerk, you're gonna be a jerk anyway and people are gonna treat you that way. But if you're a good person and you, you do try and treat everybody the way you would wanna be treated, yeah. you know, it does come back to you. And that I think is I think a wonderful music, thing. I think music tends to attract more of those and fewer of the others. Yes, because again, it comes down to empathy. You know, and I think as artists, as musicians, we are somewhat empathic and we do care about the people we meet. And that to me is one of the most beautiful things about this entire industry. And it's why I will never, I will, I can never imagine doing anything else with my life. You yeah, know? no one leaves the industry. No it's one. true, it's true. What, you have those old mafia jokes about it, you know? They yeah. keep pulling me well, back I mean, in. <laughs> the favorite joke I have is um, a bunch of sales reps or two sales reps at an AM show uh, probably in the Hilton bar, as sometimes sales reps tend to gather. And, and, the, and the story, the joke goes, you know, oh, do you hear about old Jim? No, what happened? He died. You're kidding me. I didn't know that. What did he have? Well, he had Shore and Harmon for Florida, Georgia, South and North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever leaves this industry. Oh, room. dear God. That's so true. That's so true. Well, um, what do you see as the future for next year? Hopefully we're all gonna be gathered in person again. Well, I just did a video for Summer Nap. You know, we're planning Summer Nap. We gotta get back. Our industry depends on oh, yeah. people getting back together. Yeah. We better darn well lead the way, right? You know, we want schools to open with music again. We want concerts. Well, we better be willing to eat our own cooking and get together. So we're planning a pretty good natural show. Small, but good. Good. Um, but by January 22, if we're not back in a robust fashion as a industry and as a world, you know, with the travel freely on, I think we got bigger problems at that point. So yeah. that's, yeah. I, I'm very bullish that um, as a student of history, every time there's uh, something like this, um, there's a renaissance afterwards, a true renaissance. And I think it's the human spirit. So I think by January 22, I don't know how if we can keep these horses back. <laughs> you, know? you know, I feel it already. I mean, Wonderful. honestly, as, as the vaccine's been rolling out, as people are beginning to come out of the, uh, the year long morass here, I feel yeah. so much positive energy in our industry right now. And I'm pretty excited yeah. about it, you know. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, a lot of money flowing around too. I mean, you know, we've been actively lobbying for aid for our industry, aid for the gig workers. I mean, we've been in yeah. front lines with many NAM members lobbying and the other groups like Save Our Sages and the venues, and really trying to, and a lot of that aid has been very, it's saved a lot of companies. It's helped people survive. Uh, this, uh, we did a webinar a week ago on the 1.9 trillion that was just signed by President Biden, $1.9 trillion. Now, it's going to help a lot. It's going to help a lot of the economy, help a lot of people. Uh, the fact that it was done with deficit spending, it's a different story. Uh, our, our yet to be uh, born grandkids will have to deal with that. Um, but for the me meantime, there's a flood of liquidity. There's a flood of economic activity coming. But I will say one thing I shared on the webinar, 1.9 trillion bucks is a it's kind of tough to get your wrap your head around that, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. we're, we're music guys, you know. <laughs> we get paid at the end of the gig, usually in beer soaked, you know, twenties. You know, um, one point nine trillion dollars is a stack of a hundred dollar bills, fifteen hundred miles high in the sky. Let me say that again: one point nine trillion dollars is a stack of hundred dollar bills that extends fifteen hundred miles into the sky. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, that's all I got. That's all I got. I think, look at the time. <laughs> I mean, I just, I just need a minute to go and adjust my entire worldview and I'll, then I'll be back after that. But wow. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. And I'm, you know, I mean, we, we had started a Facebook page to try and connect people early on in the pandemic, you know, all the live gig workers and everything. And I, I am happy to have been able to play even a small part in helping people out, you know, and helping connect people. And I think we all feel that way. We're all here to help each other out. We're all here to work with each other and support each other. And, you know, I look forward to being able to see my friends again in person. Yeah. You know, so we'll leave it at that. I will look yeah. forward to seeing you in Nashville. And uh, let's do it. I can't yeah. wait. I can't wait. I'm going to be the happiest camper, even if I have to wear a mask. I'll be the happiest. I hope I'm vaccinated by then. Uh, but I will be the happiest camper to just 
you know, meet at the Pancake Pantry with Andy Zildjian and Brad Smith from Hell Leonard. It's kind of, there's traditions everywhere, right? Yeah. But Nashville, Pancake Pantry is kind of an important one. So, uh, yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait for Nashville. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Joe Lamont, thank you for being my guest. It's been a pleasure. We will do this again. And again, we've solved nothing, by the way. We've actually accomplished nothing. But we've told a few stories and we've uh, shared what we believe is maybe at the heart of all this, which is to be of service. That is it exactly. And if we're helping one person, if we are inspiring one young person yeah. who wonders what the heck they're going to do with their lives, yeah. you know, my work here is done. Well, I say it's okay because I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> I don't want to grow up. Come to the right place. Yeah. You come to the right place. <laughs> you know, everybody asks me what I'm going to do when I grow up, and I just tell them I haven't decided whether I want to grow up yet. Yep. And here, maybe like the Never Never Land, you don't have to. Maybe so. Okay. All right. We'll leave it at that. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.